Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. On today's show, we have Mark Fisher. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. It's glad to be here. Mark, you have one of the most fascinating time tracks in the Church of Scientology. How did you get into the church? What year? Uh, I got into Scientology back in when I was a sophomore in high school, 1973. My, my dad uh, was retired military, and we were in the Washington, D.C. area. He picked up a Dianetics book, read it, and then he started getting some auditing at the founding church of Scientology in D.C. And within about six months, we were wondering where he was going, and then he said, Mark, I think you should come in because I think this would help you. And so I, I did. I went in and, and uh, did the communications course, and then I started getting some auditing. And um, I was, you know, I was, a, I was only, you know, 13, 14 years old at the time, but I had, you know, a, feelings about past lives, even as a young child, as a young kid. And it was in my first or second session that I actually, you know, felt like I got validation for the fact that I had lived before, and that basically hooked me. I mean, people go, well, how, how do you get hooked in Scientology? It's because after, after you know, you do, you're doing things, you're doing a course, you're getting auditing, and something something really hits on something that's really, really core to you and what you believe, and then at that point you're hooked, you know, because you've had it validated. Somebody's saying, oh, you know what, this is really happening, and I, you, you feel like somebody's finally acknowledging you. And so I got hooked at that point. And um, and so then I went through, you know, my high school years um, working, and, and I paid for my own auditing. I got all the way up through um, the lower grade chart and my grades myself. And then um, in, around the time that I was about to graduate from high school, um, I instead of going to, I got, I was a, an Eagle Scout. I was one of the top students in school. I got accepted to three, you know, really prestigious universities. But I met um, a couple of Sea Org members who were at the founding church at the time, uh, Greg and Sandy Wilhair. And uh, I had never met anybody like them, and they were telling me stories about L. Ron Hubbard and being on the ship Apollo and, and the, the new clear land, the Clearwater land base and all that, and I just was enthralled. To me, it was like a 007 story. I was like, I, I, I really want to go do this. I want to help you know, my fellow man, and, and this is the way to do it. So rather than going to college, I decided that I would sign my billion-year contract and join the Sea Org, and that's when I moved down to Clearwater, Florida. That was in July 1976. So, wow, that's really a rocket ride you get in. And I wanted to add, you know, people want to know what the allure of Scientology is. And at that point, especially in the 70s with the New Age, the rise of the so-called New Age movement, which was actually things from Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, the East. Yeah. Uh, writers like Alan Watts were popular. Uh, past lives in the uh, Judeo-Christian framework of the United States, past lives were viewed as demonic possession. And, and because the U.S. was in a post-Christian age, according to some writers, people were looking for alternatives. And people who had past life experiences or spiritual experiences, deja vu, out of body, because Christianity couldn't accept them, uh, Scientology certainly provided a, an alternative for them. And even writers like William Burroughs got into it for that reason, to explore consciousness. So it's not unusual at that time in the 70s for a young man such as yourself to go into an alternative you know, form of religion. Now, you're at, you're in, in, uh, at Flag Land Base now. You've signed your billion-year contract. Yeah, go what happens? Uh, what I, I just wanted to reiterate one thing to what you just said. Um, see, I got in Scientology in 1973. I was born in 1958. And when I say I got validated on my past life, I realized in session that I had been in Scientology my previous lifetime because 1958, you know, I mean, I, I realized that I'd been in Scientology before. And that was the thing that really hooked me. And, and, and I don't know if that was a control mechanism from their point of view or what, but that's where I went. Wow, and I was started telling stories about things that I remembered, and I, I remembered being in Washington D.C. So, that, so like there was a lot of concreteness to it at the time, and also I agree with you too on the 70s. You know, people look at Scientology now and the organizations, they're empty, they're, you know, there's nobody there. But boy, in the 70s, they were booming. I was telling uh, somebody recently, I mean, it was not unusual to have 100, 150 people on the communication course Monday through Friday in the evening, and on the weekends even more. I mean, you were right. It was, it was boom time during that period. Well, yeah, and certainly uh, the uh, CIA's remote viewing program, which came... In the early 80s, under uh, Ingo Swan, Hal Pudoff, they were both OT7s who had left the church. Right. 
So as a, as a nexus or a place where free thinkers could go, what the church was back then was quite different from what it became. Yeah. Okay, so you're in the Sea Org. You've had your past lives acknowledged, and now you're ready to serve the group. So you're at Flag Land Base. Right. And what kind of, you know, you met uh, Greg Will here, mm -hmm. Sandy Will here. When do you meet David Miscavige? Well, here's the thing. I, I graduated high school in June 1976, and within I w was planning within the next four weeks to go down to Clearwater. So right after July, 4th of July, it was uh, the bicentennial, for July 4th, 1976. Um, I remember it. Yeah, and then right after that holiday weekend, I flew down to uh, Clearwater, Florida, and uh, as soon as I got there, I, I went down there under the intentions of becoming an auditor, a trained auditor down at FLAG, but as soon as I got there, I was intercepted because I was I was only 18 years old uh, by the Commodore's Messenger Organization, and that's that's the organization that was set up that were actual people that worked directly for L. Ron Hubbard, you know, that, that handled his traffic, his, his um, you know, all, all of his personal needs, and I, and I was, of, they were all teenagers, and I was of that age, so I would say, listen, would you like to go work for L. Ron Hubbard and be in the Commodore's Messenger organization? L. Ron Hubbard was the Commodore. He was the head of the C organization. And I said, absolutely. I mean, that's, I mean, that was my dream at that point. I was like, L. Ron Hubbard, I mean, he was a god to me. You know, he was like, he's changing, you know, history. I, I absolutely, the closer I can be to him, the better. So I was trained, I was traded immediately. And, and uh, so I was brought up to the, uh, um, up to the, I think it was the ninth floor or the 10th floor. I think it was the ninth floor of the Fort Harrison Hotel. And that's where all the Commodore's messengers uh, lived in dormitories, and I was brought into my dormitory, and my, my roommate at the time was David Miscavige. Wow. So let me get this straight. 1976, it's July, you're at Flag Lamb Base. The Commodore, L. Ron Harbor, is still very large and in charge. He's alive. Mm -hmm. You... Your roommate is David Miscavige, of all people. Yeah, and he had just he had just joined a month before because while I was graduating high school in June 1976, he was dropping out at the age of 16, and he was a high school dropout, and he couldn't wait to finish to get 16 so he could join the Sea Org. And so when I met him, he had just finished. Um, the first thing you do when you get in the Sea Org is you do what's called the um, – EPF or I forget States Project Force and where you do your Sea Org basic training and you do uh, lots of uh, uh, manual labor while you're doing your training and he had just finished that while I had just arrived and was just about to start it so we be, we were roommates at the time and he was a hey I'm Dave Miscavige you know what I mean I got to meet him and um, uh, he thought it was hilarious that I that I had a high school diploma I had brought my high school diploma with me and he, he, <laughs> <laughs> because he said he said everybody in Commodore's Messenger Org nobody's graduated high school, you know what I mean they all they're all raised on the ship and uh, so they they they, they uh, uh, nobody nobody had a high school diploma and as a matter of fact there were two people Mark Yeager and my future wife Julie Catano because they were under 16 they still had to go to Clearwater High School at the time until they turned 16. So they actually had to go to, to high school that, uh, that, I guess, that, that year. But it was, so it was pretty funny. Now, that's an interesting point, that uh, a high school diploma is, is not well thought of uh, by David Miscavige. And, nor why would it be? Because David Miscavige's own story is that he was sickened with the drug abuse and the behavior in his high school, and he couldn't wait to drop out. That's what he told me at the time. He goes, I can't believe, how could you, how could you stand it, the drugs and this and that? I said, because I didn't hang out with the drug people, and it really wasn't that prevalent at that time in our high school. I mean, there was there were some people doing it, but uh, it's just a question of who you're hanging out with. I, he had a bad experience, and I was like, I actually had a really good experience, you know? Sure, and and as an Eagle Scout, you would. You would have selected your friends carefully, and, and that says a lot about you because it's not easy to become an Eagle Scout. L. Ron Hubbard was also an Eagle Scout, so you shared that with the Commodore. That distinction. Now, what were your what are your general impressions of Miscavige when he's 16 years old? Well, yeah, Do you see. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, what are your general impressions of David Miscavige when he's 16 years old? Do you see him as the future leader of the church? Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I thought of him at the time. First of all, I just wanted to reiterate one thing, which is that I mean, I was raised in a family that had high expectations and demanded, you know, like quality education. If you're going to be a Boy Scout, you're going to get become an Eagle Scout. If you're a swimmer, I was a swimmer, you're going to be a state championship swimmer. You know what I mean? And and they always encouraged without 
discouraging, you know. So that has a lot to do with my future decisions in Scientology when I decided to finally leave. Uh, I just wanted to state that because my parents were a big, big uh, influence on me. Um, but as far as Dave Miscavige at the time, um, he, I'll tell you exactly what he was like. Um, I tell people he was an asshole even better. <laughs> now, I say that, that's, he, was, he was a jerk. He, he actually he was nice, you know what I mean? He, like he was like buddy buddy, and he's he's kind of a, a guy's guy type of thing. And um, you know he he was real excited to be there, but he couldn't wait, you know, uh, to get with L. Ron Hubbard. Okay, um, at the time when I arrived there, I fully expected L. Ron Hubbard to be living up in the penthouse of the of the Fort Harrison. And uh, it wasn't until I got there that I found out, no, he wasn't there, you know, that he had to leave and he was in hiding. And I'll, I'll never forget one of the first conversations I had with David Miscavige. I said, well, well, what do you think? Do you think that he'll come back here? And, he, and Miscavige said, no, 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 we'll go there. We'll go where he's at. And uh, he, that was his goal. He wanted to be next to the old man. He wanted to be, um, you know, um, up there with L. Ron Hubbard. And uh, you could tell he had a social climbing uh, mentality even at that young of an age. Oh, yeah, the comment, we'll go where he's at, certainly says a lot. And it's not unusual uh, in ambitious people. And, you, you, and I'm glad you described uh, – or should I say, it's interesting that you would describe David Miscavige's social climbing. He's obviously very ambitious. Now, what do you get assigned to and what does David Miscavige get assigned to? Do you continue together? Well, exactly. I'll tell you what happened was, I'll just give you an example to illustrate when I finally realized that something different about this guy is that, you know, after uh, dinner, we had, a, you know, we had, you'd have to muster and get together as a group after every meal time. So like at the end of, uh, we were up in our hanging out in our dormitory up on the ninth floor and, um, we had to go run down, you know, go go down to the um, second floor from for muster. Well, I I was waiting for the elevator to go downstairs, and he said, oh, "We're going to be late." So he ran down the stairs. I took the elevator down, and I walked into the the boardroom where we were having the muster. And he was the MAA at the time, and he already was calling roll, even though it was two minutes early, and I actually was on time. And he made a point of pointing out that I was late, and that's when I realized that the guy was a little bit two faced. You know what I mean? Um, it was a minor thing, but it just happened to be, a, you know, a great example of his personality going forward. Um, but, yeah, he actually, at that point, then, I started doing my manual labor, which in, in, um, encompassed cleaning uh, rooms of the other senior messengers and doing laundry, okay, and then doing my Sea Org basic training. Um, and that's, at the time, Annie Broker was the co commanding officer of the of the the messengers. She was the COCMO that were in Clearwater, and so Annie Broker, her, her name at that time was Annie Rush. Um, she was in charge, and the messengers at that time were working on a nighttime schedule because I guess LRH was in LA, and he found out later, and so he, they they were doing a lot of work for him at night, so they were sleeping during the day. Whereas we had to clean the rooms and do that stuff during the daytime. What was the physical condition of uh, the flag land base, the Fort Harrison? Was it a mess? Well, it was it was a brand new. You know, they'd only been in it for a few months, and it, to me it looked like just a regular, you know, old hotel. You know, it was kind of exciting to be in this hotel. Uh, the fact that we had a swimming pool that we could go run and jump in at, at uh, lunchtime was kind of cool. Um, but, yeah, it was run down in comparison to the later years uh, where it was at. The thing, I, the thing that shocked me the first time I went down, when we went down to the big main kitchen, um, I – never seen this before but we t somebody turned on the lights at night and there were huge rats and did they get exterminators in to take care of the rats rats or rats is a long going problem down there because uh, later in my sea Org career i was in charge of uh i was over the estates in fort harrison hotel and uh they were they always had rat problems the problem was is that they couldn't um they didn't want them to die in the walls and things like that so at the time so Later, later years, this is another story, uh, the RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force, they were charged with uh, catching rats, and uh, they had a whole rat patrol that uh, they got stat their statistics <laughs> for how many rats they caught in traps. <laughs> you, you know, Scientology and statistics, you, every Thursday at 2 p.m., rats caught in traps. Yeah, I, and, I can uh, tell you, I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy named Steve Marlowe. <laughs> Was, yeah, was one I of know the first, that. He was a messenger, one of the first guys in, in the Religious Technology Center. He and the, he was in the RPF at the time, and he was the Rat Patrol I see in, in charge, the Rat Patrol in charge. And he, I'll never forget one day he walked in with a big <laughs> rat that he caught in a trap to show me and the commanding officer of states. <laughs> this is just this is just so Scientology of a a Rat Patrol I see yeah, and. Yeah. 
go product office through the rat traps. Anyway, uh, anyway, <laughs> so back, back to yeah. Miscavige and all that. What happened? I, I'll just give you a brief, brief rundown. I only lasted about four weeks in, C, in the Sea Org at the time because at the, about the third weekend, um, uh, somebody had messed up cleaning Annie Broker's room. Another girl that was on the uh, the estate's project force had messed up, and there were complaints, and there was a big flap, right? And uh, this other messenger at the time, who was also an inf later became an infamous name, Tanya Burden, who sued Scientology, you know, many years ago with Michael J. Flynn. She came down there to basically just rip our faces off, just yell at the entirety of the, uh, you know, the uh, stage project force for messing up, you know what I mean? And I'd never had anybody yell at me like that. I mean, I was 18 years old. I just had never, I was so naive. I'd never had that happen. And I immediately got defensive, like, well, I didn't clean a room. That, that was that was this other girl who cleaned the room. What are you blaming me for? And of course, the Sea Org mentality is, the group, it's you're all responsible. If one person mess ups, everybody's responsible. That's the mentality they drilled into you. Anyway, make a long story short, I decided I'm writing up a knowledge report because this is off policy. And I ended up getting in trouble to the point where they kicked me out of the Commoner's Messenger Org and they got rid of me because I wow. because I I'd, I'd made such a such a fuss about this thing. So what happened was I ended up being traded to the management bureau, like within days I was gone. And I actually was working, um, we had, you know, all of LRH's policies and technical bulletins were, you know, they were, they were printed on mimeograph machines back in the day. So we had this huge mimeo machine and, and mimeo operation. So I was shipped over and traded over there and I was put in, into the uh, filing area. And I'm sitting there filing away, you know, all these different issues and there were row upon row of file cabinets full of documents, you know, L. Ron Hubbard stuff and all that, of, of issues that he did. And I'm talking to this girl that's in there, and she's in there, and she's filing away. And I said, oh, how long have you been in here? And she goes, oh, I've been in here five, six years. And I said, oh. And we got around to, well, what's your case level? And she was an, uh, an OT3. She was like top of the bridge. And I'm thinking to myself, I've wasted my life. I've ruined myself. You know, I'm 18 years old. I just messed up. And now I'm going to be down here. I, I could have gone to college. You know what I mean? I, I had three yeah. major universities that I could have had scholarships to. And here I am. I'm filing away paper. Man, I made a mistake. So I ended up leaving the Sea Org at the time. I, I routed out. I said, oh, this is not for me, and I'm out of here. And I ended up leaving, and I had like a two $3,000 freeloader debt for my Sea Org basics. So I was gone by the end of July of 1976. And it was so fast, years later, because I rejoined. I rejoined the Sea Org so fast that my future wife had been on vacation, on, on uh, her annual leave, that I never met her because she was gone for the three weeks that I was there. <laughs> <laughs> did you feel like did you feel like at the time that you'd bit off more than you could chew? I bit off more than I could chew, but I also started having a little bit of doubts of like, well, they're not really green on white. They're not really, um, you know, uh, you do as I say, not as I, you know, you know, do as I say, not as it's written. You know what I mean? So I kind of had a little bit of doubts at that time. But I'll tell you what happened was, is I went back to Washington D.C. and I basically was di um, disconnected from, and of course everybody knows what disconnection is. I was disconnected from. I couldn't go into the Scientology organ uh, organization. In DC, and there also was a mission nearby that they wouldn't let me in the door, and I felt completely uh, alienated. My dad, uh, my dad had had become a mission holder up in New Jersey, and it's actually a funny story because he actually took over the mission where David Miscavige and his family got into Scientology. Um, but anyway, my dad was up there, and he goes, "Mark, you're going to have to pay your freeloader debt before we can we can you know really have a relationship." And I'm 18 years old. So he helped me. I arranged a bank loan. I paid it off, and I, I was able to get back in good standing. But I tried to get into college, and I, I thought I'd wasted my life. I thought I, I'd completely ruined myself. And then I, I finally got to the point where I felt bad about leaving, so I ended up rejoining Sea Org in 1978, and I went back, and I ended up back down in flag. So that, that's that's a, a nutshell story. But anyway. So you, your your little three week experience was cost you two thousand dollars. Three, three thousand. I'm sorry, three. <laughs> yeah, three thousand dollars. That's like only a thousand a week for EPS. <laughs> By today's standards in the Church of Scientology, that's cheap. Well, I, that was 1976. Cheap. So three thousand dollars was like about you know ten thousand. That was a lot of money back then, you know. Okay, I take your point on that. But still, that was that was a, an expensive uh, lesson. expensive lesson for a young man yeah. and. Uh, 
So your back end, the Sea Oregon 1978, you, you get accepted back in good graces? Yeah, no, I'll just, I'll just briefly go over it. So basically, I came back in and I, I worked first in external communications where they did they used to manage Scientology by telex machine. And, and there were just prior to computerizations or computers. So everything was done by telex, but, it, but at the time, we were just starting to computerize. So I was in there briefly. Then I became what was called an LRH communicator, where I was. Uh, there was a whole network of people who basically were like the the commoners messengers, but they but they worked with in management to make sure that LRH's policies were followed and that type of thing. So I was that over the estates area, and that's how I, I you know the Rat Patrol story came up. Um, but what happened was is that I I did my you know, I always did my two and a half hours of study every day, and I managed on my own in my CR career to get all the way through the uh, the green volumes, the organization executive course, and then the flag executive briefing course, and then I also did the data series evaluators course. And that that um, for people who don't know what the data series evaluators course is, that was where L. Ron Hubbard. Um, develop policies um, in which you could actually analyze statistics, uh, analyze information, find out where something was going wrong in an organization, and then figure out a handling, a why, as they called it, like why is that happening, and then come up with a program or plan that people could execute in order to turn the situation around. That's that in a nutshell. So I was became an expert at that, and most people could not do that in management. Um, it was you could talk to other veteran Sea Org members, and and they'll tell you that they had a hard time whenever they had to do an evaluation. It was called, whereas I took to it like a you know, I I just had a natural ability. Mark, what's interesting to me, and and this is to compare your experience as an Eagle Scout, where you earn merit badges, and I was in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, so yeah. you know. Earning merit badges, in, in Scientology, it's somewhat like earning merit badges. You're going to go up the bridge, but you earn three really high merit badges in the church, OE, OEC, FEBC, and the Data Series Evaluator. Right. Because not a lot of people get those. They're, they're hard courses. Did you ever do the St. Hill Special Briefing course? Well, no. See, here's what happened. Is like I See, to me... I mean, I was a Scientologist before I was a staff member. So, you know, I paid for my own auditing when I was in high school. All my grades, auditing, everything, I paid through my summer jobs, you know. So I appreciated the fact that I was learning stuff and that it was helping me with my life. I mean, I was a changed person. I mean, I'm not going to go into, like, how Scientology helped me, but it really helped me. The lower grades really helped me as a person. But when I got into, into the Sea Org, I'm like, all of a sudden, oh, you get two and a half hours of enhancement daily. I'm taking advantage of it. And in my Sea Org career, and most people will tell you this, staff members would avoid going to study. They wanted to work or they would sleep or they just did not want to go. To me, that was the cherry on the cake. I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn more. And uh, so that's how I got through those courses, just by diligently going, you know, just like I did when I was in school. I just diligently went through those things. Well, you're a go-getter, and the church had to have noticed. Yeah. And how do you move up? What, what, are your, what is your next move when you go back in? Well, what happened was is that management at that time in the early 80s uh, was in Clearwater in, in what's called the West Coast building uh, down there. And I was in the, the, um, the estates over the, the Fort Harrison and the Sandcastle. We didn't have all the buildings they have now. We had the Fort Harrison, Sandcastle, and a couple others. And, all, and they were looking for people who had done this data series evaluators course that they could move into management, and I happened to do it. So they traded for me, and they put me in there. And I started out as an evaluator in the management organization. And at the time, any evaluation that was done by management would have to be sent out to the int base, which we didn't know where it was at the time. It was secret. To be approved, it had to be approved by at that time Watchdog Committee, the WDC, because they were LRH's, you know, eyes and ears to make sure things were on policy and that type of thing. We didn't even know what the Watchdog Committee was at the time, but there was somebody who had to approve it before it could actually be implemented. Well, they they wanted to get rid of that because that job actually should have been in management. So I had a skill at it. So they decided, well, let's train Mark Fisher up to be the person who can approve these evaluations because he really does a good job. And at that time, several of my evaluations had been sent to L. Ron Hubbard when he was, you know, in hiding in Creston or whatever. And he actually writ, wrote back and said, what a good job that I did, you know, that I actually was good at this stuff. So I actually then was sent to the base for, uh, you know, some training and for them to basically uh, groove me in so I could take over that approval line, almost like a, a case supervisor. Uh, I would be like the case supervisor for management as opposed to a case supervisor for the technical application. 
So that was 1982, and I was sent to the to the end base for the first time. When you arrived at the end base, what did you think of the place? I was I was to me it was it was I was flabbergasted. It was mecca to me. I was like, oh my god, you know. I mean, again, I didn't know where L. Ron Hubbard was, and I saw Bonnie View the house, this little house up on the hill, and I thought, L. Ron Hubbard's up there. I mean, I was like, I thought for sure I was going to meet him, you know what I mean? Because it's a carrot that's dangled out there to you that, you know, you don't know where he is, but you know you're going over the rainbow, quote unquote. You're going, it's very 007, it's very, um, I didn't even know where I was going. I, I got flown out to L.A., and then they pick you up in the dead of night, and then you have no idea where you're driving because it's dark out. And so when you get there, I woke up the next morning, and all of a sudden I see these, these mountainous hills, and this de desert sort of land, you know, area, and it was an old, it was old and run down in those days. But I still thought, man, I've arrived, you know. And then, of course, I find out almost immediately that he's not there. <laughs> Mark, did you ever get to meet L. Ron Hubbard? I did not. I never met him personally. I had communication back and forth with him over the years, uh, particularly having to do with management and the evaluation line. Uh, but no, I never met him. That was my goal. I mean, uh, and it was a goal of a lot of Sea Org members in those days is that you wanted to be close to L. Ron Hubbard. David Miscavige had that same attitude, that same goal. You wanted to be close to Source. You wanted to be close to L. because that's where things were happening. And um, to the point where, uh, you know, just in my own history, you know, my dad, my, my father and my brother, they both left Scientology in 1980. They, my, my dad actually got declared in those days for, that's a whole other story, but anyway, he ended up leaving and I had to make the choice of disconnection from my father and my brother or staying, you know, or, you know, continuing. And you know what, I, in hindsight, it's 2020. I mean, I, to me, disconnection is the worst thing that Scientology does in my humble opinion, right? But that, yes. in those days, I was I was uh, ego driven, and I was I had a goal. And to me, the fact that my 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 dad had left and my brother had left was going to stop me from achieving my goals. And I hate to say this, but a lot of science, I've thought about this over the years, a lot of Scientology is ego-based. It's status-based. It's, you know, you're going to get to the next level. Oh, he's an OT8, or he's a, he's a class this, or he's a class that. They would get more deference, you know, as opposed to just treating them as people. And, and, and that was the same way. I mean, if, if it was going to be an impediment to your goal to meet L. Ron Hubbard and work with him is the fact that you had to throw, disconnect from your father and your, and your brother, that's what you did. And I, I trust me, I, I went through, you know, grief about this after the fact when I had to reconnect with my parent, my father and my brother afterwards. And I had to mend a lot of fences because it, it, a lot of these decisions that people make when they're disconnecting is all about themselves and not about the big picture. Mark, I'm glad you said that for, for a couple of reasons. It has been said that the purpose of Scientology is to create super egos. Do you agree with that statement? Well, I, I, I guess, I don't know about that statement, but it is to create, to make the able more able, you know what I mean, to create these super beings. And the attraction to me of the OT levels, because I actually got all the way up to OT7 while I was in the Sea Org. Again, another unheard of thing. You actually made it up to Scientology's Britain. Uh, yes, I got auditing, you know what I mean? I, I, I made it up there. But, you know, at the time I believed it, but now... The OT levels to me were just, they, they didn't really do anything for me. I think it was just more of me wanting to believe it. But again, it was the same thing of like, you're making a super being, you're making somebody that has abilities that other people don't. And, uh, and that was definitely the mindset. So really, maybe the word ego is the wrong word. Maybe it's you do want to become a super being. Well, yeah, I'm just using that in terms of other, yeah. what maybe other people could understand in terms of ego. And, you know. Well, I guess what I'm trying to tease out uh, and, and this is not, this is a, a subtle question, so let's look at it a different way. You're willing to disconnect from your father and brother because you have to, the church forces you to make a choice. Are you going to become, are you going to continue up the bridge, right. continue to become a spiritually powerful being, or will you walk away and choose these people who've left the church? Right. And you choose, if I'm hearing you correctly, you chose on the side of your own ambitions and for the sake of the church. Absolutely. And that's got to be very agonizing for you. It is now, and it was, you know, after I left. But at the time, of course, you, you, you're focused. I mean, a lot of, I mean, 
I've been around a lot of Scientologists, you get focused on what you're doing and you, to the exclusion of what's happening around you in the world. Um, you know what I mean? People don't pay attention to world events. People don't pay attention to what their family members are doing. And they're just focused on their next step on the bridge or their next training level or the next thing that, that's going to help benefit them. And now it's, you know, it's transported. I, I see it changed over to the International Association of Scientologists where it's, where's your next donor level? You know what I mean? I want to be, a, you know, the, the person in the front row, you know what I mean? Um, it's very much a meritocracy type of thing almost through, you know, the more you give, the more, we, you know, the more status we give you. And I, I think that's wrong in retrospect. I mean, that's not the way I, I, I believe I should be living my life. I believe everybody's equal and everybody is is deserving of a chance. Okay, going back to, to 82, you, you're at Impbase. Yeah. And you've made your you, you've made your choice to stay there. What what position are you doing? Is uh, are you writing programs? No, I, I was uh, approving the uh, management evaluations that were being done. I was only there for a couple of months. Then I get sent back to to Florida to run it. And for the first time ever, uh, we, we we went on this whole evolution because Scientology was actually booming in the early '80s. I mean, this is right after L. Ron Hubbard released uh, Ned for Otis, the Flag Land Base, but also in the organizations. This is prior to 1982. This is like '81, '82. Um, things were really popping. I mean, we were really doing well. And for the first time ever, they actually gave me approval. I actually could approve any evaluation that management had done. That's the first time that had ever been done. And we used, we would do an all-hands evolution where we would get, we wanted to get every organization in the world with a current evaluation. That had never been done before. And we wanted to get it done for L. Ron Hubbard's birthday. And we ended up doing it. We, we, got, we got an evaluation done in every organization. And we got a huge plaque made up. And we took a photograph and we had it sent up to L. Ron Hubbard for his birthday and he was thrilled because that had never been done before. You know what I mean? So so this this was st called standard management in Scientology. This was the thing that you were supposed to do. And uh, it was it actually was really, really going well to the point where they go like, okay, now we need him full time up at the end base. So I got pulled up to the full time at the end base. And of course this is all happening at the same time. I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm sure you've heard of the Mission Holder Conference and that whole thing. This was the beginning of the mutinies and where things started to fall apart. But anyway, I got pulled up, you know, uh at that time up there to the end base and that's where I saw David Miscavige again for, for uh you know, after uh, all these years. First of all, what is an evaluation when you say that all orgs were evaluated, what does an evaluation encompass? It encompasses evaluating their statistics. Figure out where they're have where, what's the most major situation in the organization based on statistics. So, for instance, let's say they're 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 bringing in lots of income, but they're not delivering it technically. So they they have a big backlog of income to be delivered. Well, that would be a major situation. So we would concentrate on okay, well, let's get that situation handled in the technical delivery area, and then a program would be written that would be executed by the organization executives and managed and run from international management. To, it was almost like a checklist to get these things done and it would turn things around. So you're really, L. Ron Hubbard and the church are trying to optimize delivery of services, financial income, and really worldwide. optimize the- Worldwide. Yeah, yeah, worldwide. They're trying to optimize the church. Right. Now, I, re, I do remember uh, the church was booming in 81. Uh -huh. I went to, uh, like, for example, there I went to the Tustin Mission right. with some friends, and I was amazed at how hopping the place was. It was crowded. Right. L. Ron Hubbard is in charge behind the scenes. Right. Even though to, he supposedly resigned as executive director in 1967. But he is in charge. And is this the period where what have been called the Young Turks, led by David Miscavige, began to take over the church? That's correct. That's absolutely correct. First of all, L. Ron Hubbard said that he disconnected from, but he was always around, and he always knew what was going on through his messengers and all that. That's that's a whole other thing. But this is when they decided that the, the Guardian's office takeover had happened, and that was done you know, where they actually disband, disbanded the uh, Guardian's office that was run by Mary Sue Hubbard as controller you know, the whole thing with Snow White and people going to jail and all that sort of thing. David Miscavige actually ran the Young Turks and the people that went into the Guardian's office and actually got it dismantled and, and, and rearranged, right? And so he, he, built, he built up his, his, um, on his resume. That was a big brownie point for him. 
Though I was going to say one thing about Miscavige, though, that I, I was going to mention that, you know, prior to that, see, like I said, he, he always wanted to be where L. Ron Hubbard was, and he wanted to be where the action was. He eventually went to the base when they were in La Quinta. La Quinta um, uh, uh, it was called uh, W back in those days. And La Quinta, that was the first place where L. Ron Hubbard lived, right? And that's where they started doing the movies, the technical films. Well, he wanted to be involved with the technical films, so he took over being the first video, uh, the video cameraman, and then, then eventually became the actual film cameraman. So he was somebody that L. Ron Hubbard relied on to do, the, uh, to do that function because the people who had done it before would always mess up. And so here comes David Miscavige to save the day. And that's where he kind of always would build his reputation with L. Ron Hubbard as being somebody who would step in and would save the day, be it, you know, the, the cinema movies, then the Guardian's office, you know what I mean, and on down the line. Now, Mark, a question. As a young Sea Org member in 1981, it's generally agreed within the Sea Org that the Guardian's office was a criminal organization. Right. How do you get your mind around the fact that L. Ron Hubbard, whom you idolize, his wife was a criminal. Well, at the time, you know, you, when you're in the organization, you're not told that. <laughs> you know, it's like you don't. You know, it's the whole thing of like, don't read the uh, the uh, the bad news and don't don't know the stories. I didn't know the true nature of Snow White until after I left Scientology in the, after 1990. You know, it's just something that we were never allowed to to really know what was going on. And and a lot of Scientologists, you know, you know as well as as anybody, uh, they have blinders on and they're not allowed to read the media. They're not allowed to get on the internet, and basically their decisions are they're programmed for them by Scientology, and that's the way I was at the time. So it just, I mean, I was told when I asked back then that uh, Snow White was all about uh, people got arrested for the theft of government copier paper. That's correct. That's what I was told, too, was the theft of Xerox paper. I remember protesting outside the FBI building in Washington, D.C. after the raids, you know, saying how this was, you know, you know, freedom of religion and this and that. And we had no idea what we were talking about, but we were sent out there to protest, you know. It was funny to me. My first uh, job out of university was as a technical writer at Hughes Aircraft, the old Hughes Aircraft. And I used plenty of government copier paper inside, <laughs> of, you know, as a technical writer. And having used government copier paper, I couldn't get my mind around it. I thought, you know what, if somebody, first of all, you get in trouble for even being in Hughes Aircraft. You don't belong there in, unless you're cleared. Right. So I kind of thought, you know, that's just really can't be true because government copier paper, I mean, you can just go buy copier paper at the office supply store. Right. You don't have any need to steal it if you want copier paper. Right. So it didn't, it didn't add up to me, but I thought, and back then, for maybe people who were never in, after Watergate, there was a lot of distrust of the American government. That's correct. And so that it you tended to side with the church if you were involved with the Church of Scientology. That yeah, maybe the government's out to get them. Yeah, and it was kind of the us versus them mentality. You know what I mean? It's fomented by L. Ron Hubbard, really, to be honest with you. I mean, it happened in the early 60s when they, when the FDA, you know, confiscated all the e-meters from the Scientology Church, and then, then it went on from there. I mean, it even goes earlier than that now, after reading Russell Miller's book and all the other books that actually started in the 50s, he was, he was concerned. I mean, but, but yeah, no, that, that, that whole time period in the 70s was the government is, is big brother and they need to be stopped, and that, that was basically the mentality then. Now, David Miscavige, would you say that by 1981 he had become a rock star within the Church of Scientology? Yes, to a point. See, he wasn't in a position of power in the Commodore's Messenger organization. He was just the action chief, which meant that he was responsible for running missions. Like if there was an emergency situation, Scientology would send two people to go deal with it and handle it. Well, he would be the person who would oversee them and make sure that they got the job done. And it was called a mission operation, and he was in charge of that. But there were other people that were in charge. Who was the, 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 the most senior position at that time was the Commodore's commanding officer of the Commodore's Messenger Org, and that was held by a, a, a lady named Dee Dee Reesdor, and then later Gail Irwin. And, um, you know, DM, 
basically had to play ball with them because they were senior messengers. I mean, there, there was a whole status within Scientology's messenger system where the, 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 the girls who had been around L. Ron Hubbard like, since they were like 10, 12 years old, they were senior messengers. They, they'd been around through thick and thin and knew a lot, you know what I mean? David Miscavige was one who'd come up through the ranks, right? But, he, but you know, you talk to some of these senior messengers, you find out that, that he was never allowed to stand watch with L. Ron Hubbard when he was handling traffic because he wasn't good at it. He, he he couldn't do that sort of thing. So instead, he he concentrated on the movies, for instance. You know what I mean? Like I'd mentioned before. And so he he tried to find other ways that he could get, you know, visible to L. Ron Hubbard through those things. But at the, during that time. He, he took over. He was the one that went in and oversaw. He ran the people who went into the guardian's office to disband it and then to reorganize it. And that was that was his next big claim to fame. Okay, then, I, and I'm glad you told me that. So he disbands the guardian's office as in his role as action chief? That's correct. But see, he actually, what happened was is that they set up, they decided it was a big project. They set up, set up a place called Special Unit, which eventually became our current office of special affairs, right? The current office of special affairs. But they set up this thing called special unit and they, they ran missions. They had senior, senior uh, Sea Org members like Norman Starkey and, and messengers like Terry Gamboa and Marty Rathman at the time. And those type of people, they were all part of the special unit, Larry, Larry uh, Brennan. And they were, they were in there to sort out uh, for L. Ron Hubbard, first of all, what was called the All Clear, which was getting all the litigation settled so that he could come back and make his movies. But secondly, it was the corporation sort out for Scientology and the the money and all the different things to protect L. Ron Hubbard and the Scientology Church going forward. And that's where the whole, you know, all the corporate sort sort out and that type of thing was done. Well, that was special unit and. Uh, um, DM, it was first called the Special Project, and DM was the Special Project Ops. He was the, the operator over the Special Project, and that was his title up all the way up until he actually went into RTC. He was, he was Special Project Ops, not COB. That's what everybody called him, a Special Project Ops. Mark, if I understand this, then the Guardian's office is dismantled, and there's what is called Special Project. Right. And David Miscavige is Special Project Operator. Correct. And then it becomes the special unit. Right. Is the special project slash special unit, is that the transitional body between Guardian's office and Office of Special Affairs? Yes. And also between, so, also between um, uh, Author Services, the, uh, the for-profit uh, organization that was set up for L. Ron Hubbard's book and money, that all came out of that special unit. Okay, so now this is very interesting. What's happening is the Church of Scientology California, the original Mother Church, mm -hmm. CSC, the IRS has determined that CSC exists as a business, and it's a criminal business that exists solely for L. Ron Hubbard to get money or engage in enormous money laundering and such. So CSC is criminal, just like the Guardian's office. Right. So during this transitional period after Operation Snow White, L. Ron Hubbard has to accomplish several objectives. He has to create a new group of churches that would become tax exempt. So he has to get rid of all the legal actions against himself. Right. And he has to dismantle the guardian's office. Right. So L. Ron Harbert has to have a lot of people doing a lot of things. Correct. He has to have a lot of lawyers. Correct. And, and David Miscavige is in there as one of the leading figures helping L. Ron Hubbard sort out the mess that, that was really left in the aftermath of Snow White. That's correct. And then, of course, he also was overseeing, special unit oversaw all the attorneys, so that meant David Miscavige oversaw all the attorneys. And then L. Ron Hubbard also has to find out a way to get good, legitimate income for himself. He can't yes. launder money anymore. And that's part of what, what Denise Brennan worked on, is how do we get L. Ron Hubbard, you know, real good, honest money that we don't have to launder? Right. Yeah. And how do we make it safe for him to come into the limelight once again? This period is so tense, and then this is 81, 81 and you have, yeah. The, yeah, you have the ex-lawyer setting up what would become Church of Spiritual Technology, RTC, and Church of Scientology International. Correct, and Author Services International, yes. Thank you, Author Services International, which is the tax-exempt, I'm sorry, the, the for-profit. For yeah. 
of CST. Okay. Now, Mary Sue Hubbard has been exiled. Yes, she's in, actually in jail. And then when she gets out, she's basically exiled, like you mentioned, yes. Yeah. David Mayo is the, uh, is he the international? At that time, he was senior CS international. He still was there, because I'll tell you the whole story about that, too. Um, but he was, he was let's, Yeah, let's put that David Mayo aside for a minute, because I do want to go back to him. Now, all these things are going on. A question I've always had is, what the hell went on with the Mission Holder Massacre in 82? Well, what triggered well, that? what happened was, I mean, you know, at the time, the Mission Holders, you know, decided to have a conference at, at the, in Clearwater in 1982. And they came and they met with Bill Franks, who, was, who had become the Executive Director International. Uh, you know, the idea was the command channels were going to be put in, whereby there would be an Executive Director International with his different executives who would handle the different functions of Scientology, like book sales and uh, technical delivery, just uh, for instance. And then you would have a management, a uh, whole other management organization that would actually, like I said, do evaluations and execute orders within the organizations to get them to expand. Okay, And then above the executive director international was going to be the watchdog committee, which was really CMO Int, the Commodore's Messenger Org. They were going to be the watchdog committee that they were going to be overseeing the whole thing, right? And at this time, RTC had not even been, you know, Religious Technology Center had not even been made known. Nobody knew anything about this, right? So uh, Bill Franks was the executive director international. They actually set him up with an office in, in Clearwater in the West Coast building. And he had a staff and the whole bit. And we were there. Anyway, he was there at this first mission holder conference. And that's when, um, you know, the mission holders, you know, back in those days, like you mentioned the Tustin mission, I mean, there were missions that were huge. I mean, they were bigger than the organizations. Orange County and Tustin, like you mentioned, up in Stevens Creek in California, uh, the mission in Davis, uh, you know, there were so many huge missions, right? And so they all came and they started demanding answers, going, what, what's going on with this criminality with the, with the Guardian's office? And, and what is this watchdog committee? And what is this and what is that? And it can you know, it all got, uh, you know, recorded and all that and they actually were, Bill Franks was answering answering a bunch of their questions. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, DM and Scientology they didn't like the answers that he was giving them. He they felt that the mission holders were actually mutinying against Scientology. And so when this when the, the tape recording of the thing got sent up there and they listened to it all, the the idea was that these mission holders are criminals and we need to get rid of them. We need to put our head on a pike and they're gonna go, they're gonna kiss our shoes. I mean that's basically the mentality. One thing you gotta know about David Miscavige and I'm sure over the years most people know this is that he loves a fight. And you know what? He didn't care if he's wrong. He's gonna make you wrong and he's gonna fight fight tooth and nail. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter that, that he's that he's destroying everything in his way. The, the purpose for him is that he's right, you know? So anyway, so him and Norman Starkey and a bunch of people, they had a second mission holders conference in Clearwater, came down, took Sea Org knives and put a declare order on, on a couple of the uh, the biggest mission holders that we had and declared them right on the spot for basically being uh, anti Ron Hubbard and Scientology the whole bit and then just basically said, you know, this is not happening anymore and, and you're going to start sending money to, to uh, Scientology that belongs to L. Ron Hubbard and, you know, the whole bit. So it, it became very heavy-handed real fast. Mark, I'm glad you, you mentioned this because uh, you know, I had visited also the Riverside mission when Ben yeah. Coron was running yeah. it. This was a big, booming place. Yeah, there's even a video um, from one of the executives there done on YouTube where he goes, he walks through the old building that's now an empty shell and walk, talk, talks about how huge the place was in Riverside. It's one of those things. It was one of those things where it's throw the baby out with the bathwater and see. Here's the thing. I mean, I, I'm gonna cr I criticize L. Ron Hubbard because he, here's the thing. You know, he was in hiding and he had one communication line, which was through David Miscavige and Pat Broker, um, and so everything funneling through them was one viewpoint and literally you could report the truth but if they didn't like it they'd make you fix the report or say you're 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 a counter intention to l ron hubbard or whatever and make you an enemy and so, so that so that these things would happen so he would then send up a report to l ron hubbard saying how these mission holders are mutinying against bill franks as ed Int, and uh, they're they're ripping you off and they're not taking your money so then l ron hubbard would then issue this lightning bolt order going down saying you need to get these guys under control and blah 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 and then then 
next thing you know, here come the suppressive person declares. Here comes the draconian things that are put on the missions. Here comes the international finance police that were then sent into all these missions and basically raped their, their bank accounts and sent the money to, to the flag and to, to Scientology, you know, Church Scientology. They just went in there and just issued fines all over the place, just took the money. It was like, like Big Brother coming to town, man. And that went on for a couple of years. You know, so it Mark, completely wiped out the mission network, which was the main feeder line to Scientology. Mark, do you think that it was L. Ron Hubbard's intention to destroy the mission holders network, or do you think it was David Miscavige's power purge? I think two things. No, I don't think he wanted to destroy the – L. Ron Hubbard wanted to destroy the mission network. But on the other side of things, he wanted people – to pay, you know, you know, he, he thought that these people were mutinying, and he, so he wanted, you know, you know, just like anything. I mean, whenever L. Ron Hubbard saw an enemy, he went after him, and he said, "You got to make these people pay," you know. But the other thing too, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm getting way into the weeds here, but uh, listen, during that time period, in, in retrospect, L. Ron Hubbard was all about getting as much money as he could to L. Ron Hubbard in those days through the corporate sort out, through author services, and through uh, the ties that they were going to get from the mission holders. It was all about these guys are ripping me off and ripping Scientology off, get the money, you know what I mean? And, um, and that, that, was, that was a shame because that's not what Scientology was about. We were there to try and help people. Mark, two questions. First, do you know the movie Scarface? Yes. Okay, uh, Tony Montana, Al Pacino's character, mm -hmm. do you think David Miscavige is sort of like that? Is he, is he that high energy, rip their faces off, do anything it takes? Well, he is. Here's the thing. I mean, I worked for him for many years. I mean, and I, got, I lasted almost seven years as his assistant, whereas, you know, most people, they failed pretty quickly, is that, you know, he leads by fear. I mean, he's very competent at getting things done, but he does it ruthlessly. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there's a way to encourage people to do things, and then there's a way, like, you know, a dictator, to make them do it under penalty of death. And that's the way he is. He's, he's under penalty of death, which in Scientology means being declared or sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force. You know what I mean? That, I mean, that, that, and to Scientology Sea Org members, that is a fate worse than death. You know what I mean? So he'll use that to get things done. But so if he sees something that he doesn't like, he'll get right in your face and just blow up and just yell. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, he, he yells like unbelievable, right? Um, but what I got, what I finally learned out when I was working with him for a while was that when you're working for him, he could be yelling at you, but he's really yelling about the situation. And so I would always, I could appease him saying, sir, I'll take care of it. I'll handle it. I'll handle it. Let me do my job and I'll handle it. I'd calm him down and then I'd go out and I'd handle it. And I got a reputation for, for taking care of things. And when you do that, then he respects you. And, uh, and it, you know what I mean? So that, that's, how, that's how it works. But he always takes the credit, though. Anything that ever gets done, and you can talk to Marty, you can talk to any of these people, anything that's good, he's 100% the one who gets the credit. <laughs> well, that's funny because in, in corporate life, it just you know that you have to make the boss look good. Yeah. And they're going to take the credit for the, their bright idea, and anything that's wrong was your screw-up. I, I learned that. So I learned that. First hand, when I did an evaluation that was sent to L. Ron Hubbard when I was working for David Miscavige, and David Miscavige wrote to L. Ron Hubbard, I saw the dispatch he put on top of it, making it seem that he, he, that he had done the evaluation. So he didn't even mention me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's why I went, okay, oh, yeah. he's just grabbing the credit. That's why I knew he was just feeding LRH whatever he wanted him to hear. Mark, do you think it would be correct to say that David Miscavige confuses leadership for domination? In other words, in his mind, is domination leadership? Yeah, he is power hungry. He's dominant. I, I can't explain it. I mean, like I said, I saw it when he was 16 that he wanted to be near power. But I don't. I, I mean, I didn't realize that how calculating he probably was back even in those early days. You know, I mean, he got to the point where he realized that by controlling the communication line to L, that L. Ron Hubbard was the power. That if you controlled the communication line to L. Ron Hubbard, then you had the power. Do you know what I mean? And that's why the messengers were always powerful, because they controlled the, the communication line to L. Ron Hubbard. But when he went in hiding, you know what I mean? The only line was from, L, was from David Miscavige through Pat Broker to L. Ron Hubbard. Do you know what I mean? And then when L, you know Pat Broker and Annie Broker, they're off running the, the, the horse ranch and taking your stuff to L. Ron Hubbard, they're not paying attention. David Miscavige realizes that I can do basically what I want. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, as long as I cover my tracks, you know, I can do what I want. I can grab power here. In 1982, 
David Miscavige has a very bad asthma attack. Paul Grady takes him to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And David Miscavige has an epiphany during this medical crisis that power is assumed. Yeah. It's there for the taking. Yeah, I've heard that story. And his own actions corroborate his epiphany. It's there for the taking. Well, listen, I, I mean, we're later down the track, but later down the time time track. But I, I mean, I saw him him doing that when he after L. Ron Hubbard died, when he maneuvered around to get rid of Pat and Annie Broker. I mean, I was around during that time period, and it took a, it took time for him to get all his ducks in a row. And they weren't thinking that way. They see, in other words, like they weren't Pat and Annie Broker weren't thinking like. I need to make sure that I got everything set up so that I got things under control. They didn't ever consider that somebody below them would actually try and stab them in the back. Do you know what I mean? Or if they, oh, or yeah. if they did, they were so blind to it that they, that they missed it. But meanwhile, I was on the other end working for David Miscavige every day. He was, you know, he'd say one thing to those people, but then as soon as he got off the phone, it was how can we move around these people because these people are off source and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, I mean, he was a calculating person absolutely all the way. Mark, thank you for these very interesting insights about David Miscavige's rise to power along with that of the Young Turks in the early 1980s in the Church of Scientology. For our listeners, we are going to continue with Mark Fisher Part 2, and that will be online very shortly after Part 1. This is Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. And as always, you can find us online at survivingscientologyradio.com. We're available on iTunes where we leave the search category Scientology, and we're also available at Surviving Scientology on YouTube. Thank you for listening.